All right, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, we are back for another Boca Podcast episode. And uh, I, I was telling my guests before we started recording, I, there's this genuine curiosity uh, behind the tone that you're hearing in my voice, and certainly the excitement. Uh, and I have with me today Kristen Schurer, who is going to be joining us to talk about how to develop social media engagement that works. Um, and this is certainly a compelling conversation. We'll get there in a second. But Kristen, thank you so much for hanging out with me, hanging out with our listeners today. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. I'm excited. I, me too. And, and again, for our listeners, I mean, it's it's funny, after close to 500 episodes now, um, I still... I still get curious and I still get excited. And, and I think that's helpful for all of us. Uh, the last thing that anybody wants is somebody that's bored talking. So <laughs> this will, this yeah. will certainly not be a monotonous conversation, but I, I, I wanted to just jump right into it. And, you know, the first question that we normally get to here on the show, certainly for the last little while uh, is about brand position. For those of you listening in, if you're not familiar with the concept, brand position really is just the UVP, the unique value proposition that your brand brings to market. Hopefully it's unique. And so to that end, Kristen, I'm curious, what is your business's brand position? Yes. So my brand position is specializing in capturing how you live, love, or work out West. So um, my photography is a little different. I've combined my passion for the Western lifestyle um, with photography. So I specialize mostly in Western lifestyle and all those who are around and um, work in our lifestyle and everything about it. And it is super compelling work. I mean, this is the stuff that you you would expect to see. I mean, I'm, for example, I'm on the homepage of your website. And for everybody listening in, if you go to KC, or excuse me, K-S-C-H-U-R-R photo.com, um, you can see what I'm looking at. But the homepage, the, fir- the first image, the header image, is just this stunning image of horses. Are those wild horses? Um, no. So those are actually our, um, our horses here at the ranch. Um, I live on a ranch in Eastern Montana. Okay. Um, so a lot of the photos you do see on the website or any of the photos there are taken on a ranch. So some are cults, so they are a little wild, but, uh, most of those are horses we use to work actually here on the ranch. Oh, it, they're just beautiful. And, and what I was getting at was I, you would expect to see an image like this and, and some of the others that you post in your Instagram feed, uh, which I'll share here in just a second, and like 40 by 60, 60 by 80, like a, a massive print, like in a log cabin, uh, maybe printed on yeah. canvas or something like that. I mean, it's just, it's really beautiful, beautiful work. It's captivating work. Uh, so I have to give you major props just in general to begin with. Awesome. Thank you so much. Yeah. That photo you're talking about, um, I've had someone request it in a huge canvas. So it's absolutely one of, you know, people just love that photo and um, I love it too. So well, and for everybody listening in, if you want to see a bunch of examples of Kristen's work, what all you need to do then is go to K, well, certainly the website that I already shared, but go to her Instagram feed as well. K S am I'm doing it again? Yeah. K S C H U R R. I don't know why I'm fumbling on that. Uh, K S C H U R R photo on Instagram. We'll link to it in the show notes at bocapodcast.com. But I want to get back to the brand position statement, Kristen, because I really love what you've done with this um, capturing how you live, love, or work out West. Um, it is, first of all, it's simple, it's short, it's to the point. But the brilliance of it, I think, is that, that you're able to effectively um, encompass a broader market without sounding too generic. Uh, you're, you're specific in that you say you capture the the way that people live, the lifestyle, the general lifestyle. You alluded to that already. Love, so that enables you or, or sets you up to photograph various romantic connections. And then work, certainly the, the work element of lifestyle there in, in, in a very specific location out west. Um, I guess it's kind of a broad location, but it, that that in and of itself gives you a bit of flexibility as well. I, th- I think this is really beautifully crafted. Did it take you a while to come up with a position statement? Um, you know, this is a funny story. Um, and thank you for all those compliments. But I was listening to your podcast and driving, which I normally do. Um, I live probably an hour and a half from a big town and 30 minutes from a smaller town. Um, and I kind of just came up with it while listening to the podcast. I know that's kind of funny, but... I just needed something for where I live and my type of work mm-hmm. that, like you said, needed to encompass 
a wide range of my photography. I, unfortunately, I, since I do live in rural Montana, I don't cater to a tight, tight specific type of person. I can do an engagement session or I can do some commercial photography, but I knew what I loved and I knew that my business is based on the Western lifestyle in general. And so I just wanted to keep it short and sweet. And it kind of just came to me driving one day. So that's the story behind it. I think it's great. And and honestly, I don't think it's even funny. I, I think it's wonderful and that that our <laughs> that the podcast is is adding that kind of value that you were able to get something from it. So I'm I'm so thankful for that. I'm glad that it, it was helpful. And again, this is for those of you listening in, this is a really wonderful example of a brand position statement. Um certainly a bit of an anomaly, as Kristen pointed out, it is a little bit more general, but she kind of had to do that because of where she lives. Yet there's a certain amount of specificity to it, which I've already alluded to. I, I think it's a really wonderful balance. It gives you a lot of flexibility, Kristen, to tap into more than just one potential target client uh, or market. And that's really wonderful as well. So wonderful example. All you listening in, make sure you take a cue from from Kristen here. And and as well, even just the brevity of it, I think is, <laughs> is, is, is wonderful. But I want to keep going because we have so much to talk about. Talk to me about customer experience. Um, it, well, first of all, as a business owner, photography business owner, how long have you been running your company? Um, I've been in business since June of last year. So, and I can tell that story now, or we can get into that later, but um, pretty much I was laid off because of COVID. I was working um, for a livestock publication and um, I was laid off in June. And so I took photography full time. I, well, again, props to you. I mean, the fact that you would, that we'd make that move and really, a disconcerting time, I think says a lot. Are you glad looking back in hindsight? Are you glad for having made that move? I mean, is it something that's panned out that you feel really good about? Oh yeah, absolutely. A hundred percent. Um, you know, I was wanting to make that jump and I'll try to keep it short and sweet, but, um, I was kind of miserable in that job and I wanted to, I had already started taking photography sessions on the weekends, So I was building up to that, but I was kind of like most people too scared to go full-time. And actually I had an accident with a horse. I got kicked in the head. Oh no. Um, and I, yeah. And so I kind of told the story shortly on Instagram, but the same day I got back from the ER, I got laid off from my job. And so I kind of made the decision there. I was like, you know, I love photography. I love photography as a kid. I made like my own business cards when I was a little girl. And it's something I've always been passionate about, but I was too scared to take that leap. And I think I literally kind of got a kick in the pants and I decided that's when I was going to start my business and go full time and give it a go. And I am so glad I did. I think I um, booked 25 sessions just last year. Oh my word. Um, yeah. So it's been awesome. And I'm so thankful. I think things are definitely working out and meant to be. Wow. Wow. Brilliant. Okay. So in, in a relatively short amount of time, then I guess as a business owner, certainly full-time business owner, talk to me about the most important principle, at least for you and providing a great customer experience. What have you seen great results from? You know, um, I just really like to be personable. I like to make people laugh. I like to ask people their story. It doesn't matter whether it's a cowboy that's 80 years old or someone that just got engaged. I just really like to know who I'm working with and make sure they feel comfortable and nice. And I like, I'm a little bit sarcastic. And so I like to crack jokes and I think that puts people at ease too, but that's what's worked best for me in my business and who I am. So. I love that. You know, one of the things that, that um, in fact, I, I grew up with sarcasm. My, my mom was somebody who, I, I, and it's interesting because this is quite a stark contrast to my tendencies. Um, I'm a little bit, yeah. I guess I'm a little bit uh, drier in that sense. I'm a little bit more structured, a little bit more inside the box, and I'm continuing to, to learn to loosen up a bit. But my mom brings a certain level of sarcasm to, it seems like almost every conversation that is so endearing. I love that. I want to be more like that. And I'm sure people are yeah. <laughs> are kind of taken to that too, especially in the context of a professional interaction and being in front of the camera, maybe they're a little bit nervous and you kind of break that, break the ice, if you will, uh, with sarcasm and humor. I, I bet that really creates a great environment. It does. And like, especially I just had um, an engagement session 
last week, the weather's been really nice in Montana. So, and you could tell, you know, couples are a little stiff at first. A lot of these couples out here have never had their photos taken. I was like, do you guys need a beer? Like, what do we need here? And, you know, if they're not driving and if they're there and they need a beer and they need that to relax, I definitely encourage it and anything I can do to make people comfortable and have fun. So brilliant. Well, yeah. And speaking of weather, my goodness, what's the, what's the temperature out there like right now? So it's actually, we've had a really mild winter. So today I think it's probably in the thirties, but two weeks ago it was in the negative 20, negative 25. Oh, so it wow. changes. Okay. That's, yeah. see, that's so funny because to you 30 is mild and, and, and I'd be shivering. <laughs> that's so funny. Yeah, no, it's super nice. I'm probably going to head out outside today after this. And so the sun's out and it's, I think 30 degrees. So, wow. Okay. See, it's literally double that 62. I just looked here and, and it's actually been kind of nasty lately as well. So it, today it's blue sky, beautifully sunny and, and relatively warm too. So I also need to get outside, but I am, I'm a bit jealous of where you live. I know it's rural. I know it has its challenges, but at the same time that the, just the open expanse of beautiful land is so compelling to me. Have you lived in Montana all your life? I have not. So I've been in Montana, um, six years and yes, it's beautiful. I mean, we see more cows or horses than people on a normal day. So um, <laughs> it's been, yeah, but no, I was born and raised in Florida actually. So I always wanted to be a cow girl and always wanted to live out West. And so after college, I, I moved out to Montana and started working for some ranches. So, wow. Well, I, yeah, yeah, definitely an envious uh, position to be in. And certainly when it comes to that, that scenery, I just love it. I know some people are like, oh, it's, it's so flat. I think it's just stunning. I, I, I would just soak it in. I'd certainly hope to spend more time out that way um, in the future. But talk to me, and, and actually, this is a good segue to, to time management. I mean, I, I know that you probably have, or I'd assume anyway, that you probably have your hands full just being on the ranch, then running a photography business. Are there certain ways that you're able to kind of create a bit of time for yourself or make sure that you don't get burnt out or overwhelmed and, and all of that? Yeah. And I, I mean, this is something I think we all are still learning, but my number one thing that, um, that I've tried to implement, especially this year is, um, not being afraid to say no. So, um, I have a lot of people approach me, um, for trade deals or this or that, or 20% off and we'll send you this product. Um, and I've had to say no to a lot of people because where I'm at with my business and where we are, it's just not worth my time or, you know, someone else can do a better job at it or, you know, needs, needs that growth. And I don't, so I haven't been afraid to say no. And then my, our schedule is a lot different. Sometimes I have to shoot on Sunday, but then I'll take a Monday or Tuesday off. It's really, it just varies. But I think not being afraid to say no to certain things and knowing what you love and what you can set aside time for. So for example, you know, we're calving here at the end of March. So I know that will be my super busy time. And I have to just set my schedule when I know those busy times here are so I can help out and do what I love. That way I don't get burnt out overall throughout the year. That makes sense. When you talk about saying no, though, I mean, what would you say, maybe from personal experience or even conversation with other photographers, is one of the the main reasons for being afraid to say no? Is it, is it FOMO or something comparable? You know, I think when I first started my business, I just, I wanted everything photography, right? Like, give me everything I can do at all. Sure. Um, but you can't, yeah, but you, you know, you can't. And I think I did accept a lot of offers that seemed awesome and they seemed, okay, I'll get a bunch of exposure for this. But then in the end, in the long run, you have to think about your time and how valuable your time is as a business owner and a photographer. I mean, put value on, on your time. And I know people know that, but we forget to do that because mm. I, I, I'm personally too nice. I would accept everything if I could, <laughs> but I can't, you know, so I think that's why it's important. We really, you know, put value on your time and know that you can't do everything, even if you want to. But I think personally for me, that's what, that's kind of what I learned over this last year in business. Now, as you're getting started in the, the full-time side of things, are you considering experimenting with delegating any of the work in your business so you can better manage your time, make sure that you're able to scale your business, but not get burnout in the process? 
Absolutely. And um, this is another funny story, but I was listening to your podcast a few months ago, over a few months ago, I think right when I kind of started my business and I was like, oh gosh, I'll never outsource editing. What the heck are these people doing? <laughs> but um, I found myself, I found myself super busy last September, actually. And I had to, I, I sent in some um, photos to photographers edit and I had you guys help me out a little bit because I was overwhelmed. And so wow, um, that's Shout something out. I definitely, <laughs> yeah. But you know, I was that type of person. I was like, I'm never going to do that. And I did because I needed the help. Like so that's something I delegated. And then last year I was struggling with like a logo and I just, I was over it. I was burnt out on that. And I hired someone to kind of help me out with a logo and help me out with um, kind of rebranding so I could have, you know, colors and fonts and things that I could just work off of. And that was awesome. I mean, I definitely encourage that. You don't need a fancy logo to start off, but for me, it's, it's really helped throughout the year. So yeah, it, it's really anything that we can do. And I, I'm finding this even now, and and I've said this before on the podcast, but there's a certain amount of, um, I guess, kind of amusing hypocrisy in, in these conversations about delegation as I own Photographer's Edit, which is all about delegation, that I still struggle with. Maybe struggle isn't even in the word, um, but I'm still learning how to do so more effectively and to do so more often. And, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm working with four or five different brands at this point. Um, and the, whether it's like you pointed out, Kristen, logo design, or just simply asking one of my team to do something for me and, and not feeling bad doing that, uh, it's it's still a kind of a learning curve for me. And, and so I, I like that we're having these conversations because it's a good reminder for me to continue to work on it myself. But it's it's super important. And uh, the other thing I'll, I'll add in here too, I, I know that I've mentioned before in the podcast that I that I don't, I mean, 99.9% .9 of the time, I don't set up these conversations about outsourcing editing, uh, especially as it relates to photographers edit. Uh, and in fact, in most cases, I don't even know if one of my guests has used photographers edit. We've worked with thousands of photographers over the last 13 years. And so I don't normally um, have that list in the back of my mind. So it's kind of fun yeah. to find out in conversation um, that you've used our service, Kristen, and I really appreciate that. I also appreciate you you giving the company a shout out. But let, let me transition to a different question. Talk to me about reading. Maybe it's audiobooks, reading actual physical books, Kindle, uh, potentially even podcasts, but an impactful business or self-help book, maybe even a podcast that you've read or listened to in the last few years that you would want to share with our listeners. Yeah. And I am um, speaking of shout outs. I have to give a shout out to my mom. Um, she's the one who recommended this book. Um, I don't get the opportunity to read a lot, but, um, I do listen to a lot of podcasts and I have been traveling. So, um, but the book I'm currently reading is dot com secrets. Um, and I don't know if anyone's ever mentioned that one or if, if you've heard of that by Russell Brunson. Yeah. Yeah, um, absolutely. I really just like the way it flows and it's easy for me to read. Um, sometimes business books, like I, I used to read a lot of investment books are just hard for me to get through and read, but I'm really enjoying this one. Um, it's kind of about your dream customer and click funnels and different types of, of just how to get your customer there and kind of upsell. I don't know if that's the right word, but um, I definitely think the dream customer portion of it is something that um, I've kind of dove into by reading this book. So yeah, I've actually got the book pulled up here on, uh, on Amazon. Uh, here it is. Uh, dot com secrets, the underground playbook for growing your company online with sales funnels. And it, it, Russell Brunson, the one that started click funnels. Yeah. So he, it's kind of a funny story because I think he started his business by selling a potato gun online, which I think is hilarious. <laughs> like one of those guns that shoots potatoes. Yeah, yeah. And the way that I understand it, he started up selling by selling the parts to the gun. So he sold like the kit, like, here's how you make it. By the way, if you want to buy this, here's the kit for so many more dollars. So that's kind of um, how the book starts. And it um, dives into, like I said, dream customer and how to get those click funnels. So Okay, well, we're going to have to link to this in the show notes because I, I'd, I'd heard of this, but I'm not sure if we've talked about it in the podcast before. So this is good. We'll, we'll put it in the show notes. By the way, for those of you listening in, make sure to, to take advantage of the show notes. Bocapodcast.com is where you're going to find those show notes. Of course, if you also use a podcast app that has the show notes readily available, you can see them there as well. But talking points, links to the resources that we discussed, you'll find those in the show notes, bocapodcast.com. 
let's jump into kind of the meat of our conversation today, though, Kristen. Uh, Instagram, you've you've not only developed quite a large following, uh, 16K followers is what I'm seeing right now on your Instagram profile, uh, but you've also been able to book what you told me was half of your business through the platform. I would assume that th- this didn't just like automatically happen or naturally happen immediately. <laughs> I, I'm curious if you can give a little bit of the backstory to using Instagram um, as a business tool. Sure. So um, I started on Instagram in 2013, not as a business tool, as a personal tool. It was back when we all used filters and those funny borders and (laughs) just post, you know, we just posted whatever we saw. Um, I remember this. It's so funny, but it was my last year in college and we were sitting by a campfire and someone took a picture and they said, Hey, I'm going to post that on Instagram. I'm like, what is Instagram? So that's when I I was on the platform first. So 2013. And I really, I didn't, I used it for personal reasons and I always enjoyed the platform. I'm a visual person. I'm sure like most photographers and I just loved it. I mean, I thought it was great. Um, I developed kind of a personal following. And then in 2017, I bought um, a Costco camera. It was one of those kind of like six hundred dollar packages with two lenses. Yeah, and I started. I started shooting again. I was living on a ranch there um, that had a bull sale, so they sell bulls. And this is going to be a weird concept, but so they sell bulls at a sale um, for other ranchers to buy for their herd. Um, so I remember I got the camera out and I just started taking pictures. And I was like, oh my gosh, these are so clear. Like, cause I had been using my phone and <laughs> yep. those filters. And I just started shooting. Like I took that camera everywhere. I brought it horseback anywhere. We went to work, I brought it. And so I started posting those pictures on Instagram and probably 2017. And if you go back, you could probably find some of my early work, but that's kind of when I fell in love with photography again, and just really started using the platform more seriously, not as a business, but just as a visual tool to show people what I was doing, what I was shooting out there on the ranch. Okay. You, you broke up just a little bit, but I, I, I heard the last of that sentence and, and I want to kind of pick up where we, we left off. Um, you, you mentioned to me just to break the fourth wall a little bit for our, for our listeners, in case you hear a slight bit of delay, you, you said being in rural Montana, um, the, the connection's not super fast. So just wanted to, to let you all know, if you hear a little bit of delay, that's, that's what's happening. But uh, it's not that I'm you know busy playing on my phone or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but you, you said 2013 started personal, personally using it. 2017 um, is when you picked up the camera, started shooting. And, and naturally, being able to post images from a, a, a nicer camera at the time. I, and I, by the way, I totally remember that feeling. Like when I first got my... Uh, and of course, this is back in the film days. So when I got my first film SLR, and that that was so well, actually, I got my first film SLR that was kind of that kind of beginner, you know, prosumer, maybe even just consumer level SLR that jumped then to the semi professional camera again, a film camera, thirty five mm-hmm. millimeter film camera. The experience, the 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 contrast and experience making that jump was super fun. I mean, in fact, it, it's kind of ridiculous to think back on, but this is two thousand. Oh, I don't know, 2001, 2002. And I, I'm, I picked this camera up. And in fact, one of the, probably the most compelling things about even the idea of getting into professional photography was the gear. You know, I spent endless amounts of time talking now about big picture concepts and principles and what drives um, our efforts in business. Back then I was a 20, whatever, one, 22 year old. And, and the most compelling thing was the exciting gear that I could pick up. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I know. And that's what's um, so funny. So I think my number one question on Instagram is what gear do you use? And although the gear does make a difference, I like, I always think about that moment when I unbox that camera and I'm like, it makes a difference. It does. It really does. And I'm the same way you are. I'm kind of a gear nerd. I rent lenses all the time now, <laughs> but back then it was just about shooting. Like I didn't know what it was. And I definitely recommend people who are, who are scared about gear or scared about taking that jump of like even buying a digital camera. I mean, just go out there and shoot with, you know, a Costco package first to see if you really love photography and you like it, if, if you've never done it before. And I mean, everybody gets caught up on the gear, I think at first, but like I said, back in the day, it was just about shooting and, and learning. And so well, I mean, it's regardless, I guess really whatever gets us started at the end of the day, if we get to the place that you and I are now, 
um, where we're much more intentionally and strategically running our businesses. Uh, it's hey, the, the backstories are fun, right? It's a fun point of conversation. But right. I, I want to get to the strategy. And before we actually touch on specific strategy that you've implemented, what was the kind of the turning point for you to, and what ultimately led to, I guess, feeling motivated to use Instagram more strategically? I just, I guess I like to think back all these stories I have in my mind as a photographer um, as I went along, but I didn't used to like black and white photos. And one day I had this photo of a bull coming out of a trailer and I was like, you know, it just, I was stuck editing it. So I actually, I turned it into a black and white photo and I posted on Instagram and it, it, I think it got over a thousand likes, which back then this was in 2019 was a lot for me. I was yeah. like blown away. So like I said, we, I, I've had to drive I have a lot just where we live. We do drive a lot um, on dirt roads and where to go to the grocery store. So I started listening to a lot of photography podcasts, a lot of social media podcasts. I just tried to start learning more about the platform. And probably back in 2019, like I said, when I changed this, you know, I started editing more in black and white. So I changed my feed. So I had every other photo was black and white. And that's really when I kind of, I was putting effort into my page. I was crafting it. I was using an app. App, you know, a preview app, which I still use today. Um, I'll put, I'll put the photo on there and preview what it looks like on my feed before I post it. So that's when I started kind of use, utilizing all those little tips and tricks and also trying to learn more about the platform in general. And what's that platform that you're using to preview or maybe even schedule your Instagram posts? Yeah. So it's just called the preview app. Really? Okay. Yeah. It's just called preview and I don't post like, or I don't put captions or anything. I just like to, um, put the photo in there and see how it'll look on my feed before I post it. Okay. I I was for anybody that heard that crashing sound in the background, (laughs) that was me trying to grab my phone so I could look this up. Is this on the, the app store or is it a website? Um, it's just on the app store. Oh yeah. I see right here. When I pull it preview planner for Instagram. Is that right? I think so. Mine just says preview. Um, there's another one called plan, which I've used in the past as well, but the app that I use, that's easy. is just, um, I think preview and it's like different colors and it looks like it's an Instagram feed. Okay, cool. Yeah. So for anybody listening in, we'll, we'll try to find the exact one. And if at, at the very least, just go to your app store, um, and search preview and you'll likely find an example of something like this. That's really cool. Okay. So you begin to, I guess, use this a little bit more strategically, at least in part due to some of the ideas that you're getting listening to podcasts. And you ultimately developed certain habits that you shared with me ahead of our conversation today that I guess we can sum up just with three points. One was to be yourself. And you kind of alluded to this earlier. Another or the second is to to gain trust. And then third is to engage in a way that you want to be engaged in return. And so I want to kind of break each of these down for the sake of our listeners and better understand what you mean by these concepts. And, and to start, maybe let's let's get into this idea of being yourself. And this is this has become such a, a popular concept in our culture and especially in the last few years. You know, people talk about being yourself or being authentic to the extent that it's almost become cliche. But I, I know that you, you seem like a super intentional person and persona. What does it mean to you to be true to yourself or to be yourself, especially as you engage with your clients? Yeah. So I think for me personally, I just, I just like to take people along on my journey. You know, I am, I'm not perfect at being myself and I'm not perfect whatsoever, but I guess <laughs> I just am who I am. Like I like to drink wine and I'm sarcastic, like I said, and that's kind of who I am online. And, um, I post things that I want to post. I kind of wear my heart on my sleeve. And, um, I think that showcases in a lot of the things I do post. Some of my captions are, sarcastic and some are motivational and some are funny and, you know, we'll tell people a little bit about me, but, um, I, that's just kind of who I am. I wear my heart on my sleeve in person. I kind of wear my heart on my sleeve a little bit on Instagram too, but yeah, overall, I think just taking people on my journey and showing them day to day, kind of what I do like yesterday, you know, I posted a video of feeding calves and people love that. I mean, a lot of people, especially this last year, haven't been able to get out much or go anywhere. And so I do have a lot of comments, like you said, where we live is an awesome place. I want to share that with other people too. 
You, you mentioned feeding calves. This is such a weird, at least people, I know that some people have weirded <laughs> out when I've shared this in the past, but when I was really young, um, I, I lived in Japan actually, and we were, we were hanging out with some, some friends and there was a, a farm nearby. We went to the farm and there was this calf and for whatever reason, my, I, th- I think my friend suggested to me that I stick my hand in this calf's mouth and so the calf began to, to suck on my hand, I guess, thinking that it was feeding somehow. It was the, yeah. <laughs> it was the craziest sensation. I mean, I, this is when I was like, I don't know, seven years old or something like that. I still to this day remember the experience, the weirdest and, and yet just funniest thing even to share. I, I can only imagine what life on a ranch, an actual ranch has to be like. It seems so incredible. I'm, I'm f- absolutely fascinated by horses. That's a you know loaded topic in and of itself. But Speaking of being yourself and also sharing life on the ranch, there's this this post actually from actually Christmas Day of you, what looks like getting out of a truck in a red dress, but with (laughs) with cowboy boots and a hat and a bottle of wine. It seems to be this kind of perfect combination of all that you just described. Yeah. And that's kind of me in a nutshell. And that post is kind of funny and I'm sure we might get into it, but I had some negative comments on that. I think one lady was like, don't drink and drive. The The truck was parked. I wasn't going anywhere. It's a self-portrait, but <laughs> I see that comment right here. That's so funny. <laughs> yeah. And I didn't respond. And, and so I know we're going to dive into this later about responding to people on this and that, but I actually, I had someone call me a clown on that post too, which I had initially, I was really upset about it, but then, um, I know we're going to talk about how to engage with people and how to engage with others. And I, I thought to myself, how would someone I look up to respond to this comment? Cause mm. they had called me a clown on the, there on Instagram. They deleted it now, but so I thought about it and I just responded really nicely. And I was like, I'm sorry, you think I'm a clown, but if you ever want to learn more about my life and want to learn where I came from and my cows and this and that, I said, I'd be happy to, to tell you about it and to go through that with you. And um, then they deleted the comment. good for you though yeah i i I know that i've had experiences on social media in the the past where there's this kind of initial tendency to to lash back Mm -hmm. and that just doesn't tend to go great places Uh, so no yeah props to you for being an example of of how we should be responding (laughs) but nonetheless we'll make sure to (laughs) well we'll actually try to post this um or share this this post in the show notes too just to give our, our listeners context and be able to easily find the find the image, but so being yourself, and I wasn't, Oh, go ahead. Sorry. I wasn't drinking and driving for anyone that was concerned about that. (laughs) (laughs) I think it's a great picture. Um, this idea of being ourselves and sharing, well, again, using that word authentic, being authentic on social media. I know that in some cases, and almost for the sake of the conversation or, or to make a point about being authentic, people are, are, it seemingly oversharing at times. And, you know, in many cases, it just, it's a lot of negative talk too. Where is the balance in your mind between being authentic, being yourself and putting yourself mm-hmm. out there and oversharing? I like to think of Instagram as like a party. So I show up, that's the first thing, right? So I show up at this party. I'm not automatically going to say, Hey, my name's Kristen Sure, buy my photography, buy my prints, this and this and this. I'm going to start to engage with other people at the party. And then when I engage with other people, maybe I'll ask them a question. Maybe they'll ask me a question and we respond. We go back and forth and we develop this trust. But I think some people on Instagram are coming into this party and they're just pushing things on people. I know I see that a lot. People ask a thousand questions on their story. And then I think, gosh, I know that helps their engagement, but I just feel like following this person is a lot of work. So I just try to think of it as how would I want to be engaged? How would I want to talk to someone at a party or how would, you know, that's just how I try to think of it. Like, obviously everyone knows, or maybe they don't that showing your face and and putting yourself out there on Instagram creates a trust and it creates a connection with people. And I know that can be overdone sometimes. I know I probably don't do it enough, but I know that's what works too. And so, like you said, being yourself and showing your face, but also engaging with people, how you want to be engaged. Not so much that, you know, it's not a job, you know, making people follow you. A lot of these podcasts do have awesome ideas about engagement, but you don't want your followers to have to think it's a job to follow you either or too salesy. 
Does that make sense? It absolutely makes sense. First, okay, so two things here because you got me excited again. So the the idea of treating Instagram like a party, just you know, I guess yeah. ultimately using that as a guideline for how you behave. I think this is a wonderful, wonderful, uh, shall we say, metaphor. Uh, it, it's it's a mm. it's a really great way to think about it because I think a lot of to your point, Kristen, a lot of photographers, and I'm, I'm I know I've been guilty of it as well, treat it treat Instagram maybe more like a, like a networking event instead of a party. And so they jump into promoting themselves and their product and their service way too quickly or ultimately way too much. And that can be off putting. And then the other way I I literally wrote this down on my network or or my notebook, rather following this person is a lot of work. I, I love the way that you describe that because some people, it is truly exhausting to, to read right. <laughs> some of the stuff that they're posting under the name of authenticity. You're like, oh my word, be, you know, share something positive for goodness sake. Like I actually want to be inspired and encouraged and entertained. And certainly, you know, maybe say 15% of the time reminded of the fact that you're a, a real human. Yes. But then take me again to what you've learned from that, that negative experience. Don't continue to drag me down that alley. That, that's kind of the, right. the kind of frustrating experience, I guess, that I've had. So I love the way that you break this down. Ultimately, treat it like a party. That's so great. Yeah. And, you know, I've just been thinking a lot about that in the last few months, even. And there are certain people, like you said, the negativity and this and that, and especially with how hard last year was for everyone. And even now, you know, with COVID and whatnot, I think people just, they want positivity and they want a little bit of a break. And even if they could find that on Instagram, whether it be through what you're doing that day or showing your face and letting people know what you're up to, I get a lot of messages about our lifestyle and people who really, you know, they send compliments and they say, you know, please keep posting you out riding or this and that. And I think that's awesome. One, because I like the input and they just, a lot of my followers just are kind of becoming my friends. Does that make sense? So on my little Instagram party platform, I just talk to people like I would kind of if we were friends. So a lot of these people, I have no idea who they are, but they're my friends now. So I just think it's, you know, like you said, positivity. And I have seen that works for me. I I think it's great. And I think you found a really great balance too, because it's, it's no secret, no mystery that you're a photographer, that this is what you do for a job and your work is beautiful. The, The feed is curated, but again, it doesn't, it doesn't feel number one, it doesn't feel overly perfect. Uh, in a way that would also be off-putting. And you are sharing mm-hmm. yourself. And I think this this post on um, the, the 25th, again, we'll, we'll try to embed that maybe in the show notes so everybody can see, but is, is a fun way that you're, you're sharing yourself uh, what this might look like, kind of the combination of, or I guess, all the, 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 the nuances of your persona via one picture. I think it's great. But there is taking that approach, which is, hey, I'm, I'm at a party. So that should drive my approach to conversation. Um, the amount that I talk about work, mm-hmm. the amount that I talk about myself, certainly the amount that I talk about anything negative. And I know that there's a fine line between not sharing enough of ourselves so that it just feels fake and then also sharing a bit for the sake of keeping things real and ultimately maybe benefiting somebody that feels like, oh, I can relate to them and their struggles. I think that's great. I just, for me personally, when I am following somebody and I see so much of the negativity, it leaves me wondering, okay, and then what? That I, I, I hear you. I feel you. I have my own struggles as well. I personally don't post a lot of it because, not because I, I want to try to, you know, come across like this perfect person, but because in my mind, if I overshare, that's just going to be, as you put it, Kristen, too much work. Anyway, I I feel like at this point I'm overstating or or reiterating what you already said. You put it brilliantly. (laughs) We'll leave that alone, but I want to go to the next point. You talked about, um, you know, first of all, just the way that you approach Instagram starts with being yourself. Um, What that then enables, I think it's kind of interesting, um, multiple things, I'm sure, but one of those factors, trust, you gain trust. And I'm curious, before we talk about how you do that on the platform, what does trust mean to you? Why does this idea of trust even matter to you personally in the first place? Um, I think trust is important in in our daily lives. And like you said, you're, um, you're really enamored by horses. And that's kind of my main example that I can put trust in is 
a lot of times we ride horses and they have to trust us and we have to trust them. And that's the same thing with your clients in photography or anyone you work with in business, who you're working with, you have to trust each other. Right. And I think, um, especially, and that's kind of a little metaphor, but it's the same with a horse as it is with who's riding it. And it's kind of, you know, scary sometimes going out there and, you know, I ride a lot of Colts and they have to trust you and and you have to be relaxed and let them know it's going to be okay. And that kind of translates over into business and in life. So, Hmm. so I I guess then when it comes to Instagram, how do you build that trust? I mean, I would assume that it would at least start with putting yourself out there, being yourself on the platform, but how do you, people know that social media is social media, right? That there is a a, whether it's intentional or not, there's a certain facade or kind of perfection that isn't real to life. So how do they know that what they're getting on Instagram is what they're going to also get in person and that experience with you as a photographer? I think the trust from Instagram comes from, like I said earlier, communication. I try to respond to every message, whether it's a simple question or someone gives a compliment or this or that. And, and I think people appreciate that because they know I'm there. They know I'm a real person. I know I have 16,000 followers, but if you asked me a question today, I would most definitely respond to you and let you know I was there and that I am a real person. And the same goes with comments. I try to respond to every comment. I remember when I was first on Instagram, I would comment on people's pages or pictures and it's nice to get a response back. It kind of creates a little bit of trust. Like, okay, I know she's there. Like she's not just a photographer hiding behind this platform. And I guess I've kind of just built on, on little principles like that. Um, I do try to show my face and, and make videos, which is, is not easy for (laughs) me. I think, you know, I don't want to sound like vain or anything when I'm on there talking about myself, but it's really helped because every video I post talking to, to my audience, I get a great response. And I think people then can see your face. Like I said, they know you're there. They know you're not just hiding behind the platform. Well, and and you've, you've kind of set us up for the third point that you mentioned earlier, which is engaging the, the, the importance of engaging others the way that you would want to be engaged. I mean, this is really just the golden rule at play. How do you, how do you do that? Um, and, and maybe I'll add, a bit of context to my question too, because I'm thinking about as it relates to not just how I engage with others or respond to others on social media, uh, but I also think about it even as a podcast host. When I'm talking, even in this conversation with you, Kristen, I'm I'm naturally excited about our conversation, interested, curious. Uh, I'm sure we could talk for two, three hours easily with with all the questions I could come yeah. up with. But <laughs> at, at the same time, I also understand that that the way that I come across not only to you but also the end listener if there's not an, a certain amount of energy and enthusiasm behind my voice, then people certainly will be less compelled to listen, maybe less interested in the podcast in general. So I'm throwing, I'm throwing that energy very intentionally into the conversation for the sake of the experience of those on the other side of me. And I certainly don't try to, ju- you know, don't just do that with the podcast. I'm, I'm intentional trying to do that in my conversations just on my day in my daily personal life as well. But do you, in responding to people on social media, how do you respond with a certain level of enthusiasm that feels genuine without also just kind of copying and pasting, not literally necessarily, but copying, and pasting kind of canned right. responses? That's great. That's wonderful. I'm excited. You know, these kind of cliche phrases that we tend to use a lot on social media because it's easy. How do you do, how do you communicate in a way that is genuine, um, that doesn't come off too? Uh, canned or too prepped or too impersonal? A hundred exclamation points. No, <laughs> yes, no, uh, I totally agree. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I love exclamation points. I probably use them too much. Yep. You're probably like, oh gosh. Yeah. Um, no. So, you know, this is a hard question because it is personal per person. And I will say there's a couple of things I think that do help. Number one, I love photography and I love the Western lifestyle. And so when people do ask me about that or do say something, I I love to respond. And I think that's great. You know, so that number one drives me, like you said, it's an energy. I think that drives you even when you are super tired or maybe burnt out. I think loving what you do and finding that um, certain aspect of your business is awesome. So that definitely drives me number one. 
Well, just just to comment on what you were saying, I, I think when it starts from a place of genuineness, when there is genuine enthusiasm behind the conversation, I think at the end of the day, that comes across, right? We have to be intentional in, in the words, I, well, at least I think so anyway, because I'm, I'm looking at my responses. I'm looking at the responses of others. I know that Instagram literally feeds me emojis or words, you know, to, to, type in or to fill in the blanks and make it easy to respond. I'm the type that would want intentionally not use those because I don't want them to think I'm taking the easy way out. So I mean, being intentional in the words that we're using, I think is really important. But at the end of the day, if we're genuinely enthusiastic, I would like to think that that people can tell that's the case. At least I would hope that's the case. What do you think? No, absolutely. And like, you know, how I think of it is like, if I see a cool picture, I mean, I'm going to comment on it. Like, I'll be like, that's an awesome photo. Or, you know, it doesn't matter if the person has two followers or 200,000, you know, I just want to be, like you said, authentic and treat people how I would want to be treated. Like, like that's an awesome picture, man, you know? And I think engaging like that. And like I said, engaging with trust and with, with just excitement of how you are, that goes a long way. Well, I, I think we could all stand to to do that a little bit more and, and to do so again, not in a way that feels it, it, to me, in my mind, it almost is, is this could be likened to something that we saw quite a bit. I, and there's still versions or variations on this that, that we see on Instagram in particular, like profile pictures or images that are posted mm-hmm. to Instagram just in general in the feed. Um, but th- the thing that was so popular for so long was somebody sitting there with a cup of coffee looking kind of out to the side and and laughing with their head back. Like that was the, especially for yeah. women on Instagram, that was like the thing that you did. And you know it's set up from, from the get-go. Right. And you know that that person, you know, 95% chance that person doesn't do that naturally on a regular basis. It, it just, it feels way too contrived. I think if we have a certain amount of sensitivity, a certain amount of self-awareness, and a genuine, then a genuine enthusiasm and intention behind what we do. It'll help minimize the, the possibility that we come across as fake and hopefully create a more genuine experience for our followers. Right. And then I think, and then you start to attract your ideal person. So mm. I lose followers all the time because I am sarcastic and I do like to drink and I do live on a ranch. And some people don't like that, but then they're not my people. Right. So, so I think like what you're saying, I mean, the, if I did that on mine with the coffee and the, the <laughs> set it up, people would be like, what's wrong. Yeah. Did you knock your head again? Like what's <laughs> wrong with you? You know, that's not who I am. Sure. I love coffee, but I'm not going to sit there. I would rather be coming out of a truck with my boots on with a bottle of wine and have some lady ask if I was drinking and driving. No, but, <laughs> um, so I, I think, and it'll make, you know, it's made me stand out. My photography is very bold. It's very textured. It's, it's not like other people's. And so, but I know that's what I like and that's who I am. And I'm not afraid to post that because, you know, I think being yourself and that's what gains trust. And like you said, it's not in general, the same photo everybody's seeing, that's going to help you have a presence on Instagram and people can really get the picture of who you are and what you do. Well, I mean, I have to say this and reiterate this, your, your photography is stunning. In fact, we've, we've spent so little time talking about it. It bears repeating, but your work is beautiful. And and some of these images, the contrast, just the contrast in the images, the black and whites and the color images um, is is beautiful. It just captures your attention. You want to look, you want to look closer um, so, so your work is beautiful. There is a variety to your point, Kristen. So you're practicing what you're preaching, certainly. But I, I think maybe we can kind of sum this up uh, with something that my friend, Sean Austin, who's been on this podcast, and I think six or seven times now, actually, over the years, has has brought up before. We maybe even talked about it on the podcast uh, when he was on. But he he asks this question. And I think initially, he was kind of asking this question as it related to his relationship with his wife. And the question is basically, what is it like to be on the other side of me? Or what is the experience of that person on the other side of me? What is it like to experience being engaging with me? Intentionally putting ourselves in the shoes of the people that are on the other side of us, whether in person or on social media, and then being super intentional to, number one, be real with them, certainly, and then add as much value as possible. And and if possible, a little bit of entertainment along the way as well. I think that's a, a great great way to to go about interacting with those 
on Instagram. And it really brings us back. Um, and I think this is an even better way to sum it up, uh, Kristen, to, to your point about approaching Instagram like a party. How would you go into a party? How would you engage with those in a party? I think that was just a, a beautiful metaphor for how we should approach this. And, and I really appreciate you sharing your perspective today about what using not just using Instagram, but using it to effectively build your business. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah, I, like I said, it is a party for me and you have to think about how you would want to be treated and um, just think about that for Instagram as well. I think we get a little too caught up on the business side of things and pushing things and being too salesy, but just think about, I think in general, how would I want to be treated on this platform and go about that and um, and voice your photography and your business in that way and um, see what works. Definitely look at your insights and see what works best for you. And like I said, you know, keep showing up to the party. Well, remind our listeners one more time where they can follow you on Instagram, also find you online um, so that they can follow you, maybe even slide a, slide a DM or two in there to ask about your work. Yeah, absolutely. If anybody has any questions, I'd love to answer your questions. But um, my handle is K-S-C-H-U-R-R photo. So k sure. Um, photo. And that's my website and my Facebook and my Instagram. So perfect. And we're going to link to all this in the show notes, bocapodcast.com for everybody listening in, make sure to take advantage of that resource. Thanks one more time, Kristen, for making time for all of us for sharing wonderful insight today. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thanks so much photographers for listening to the Boca podcast. Will you let us know what you thought of the show by leaving a review of the podcast in the Apple podcast app? And I'd love to hear from you personally with your thoughts about the podcast and suggestions about future topics and guests for the show. My email is Nathan at BocaPodcast.com. Make sure to visit our sponsors, PhotographersEdit.com, custom photo editing for the professional photographer, and Milu.com, that's M-I-I-L-U.com, the simplest way to create and manage timelines and shot lists for the events you're photographing.